Will you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Oh Lord, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's good for our wor my words and our thoughts to be acceptable in the Lord's sight because Jesus is with us this morning in worship. We meet him with us in the gospel. Now, there's truth to that statement, regardless of which gospel lesson we are reading from the gospel writers on a particular Sunday morning. But there's even more truth to that statement this Sunday morning, because today in our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 4, we find that Jesus is in worship. We find him in the synagogue on the Sabbath day in worship. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 30. It's on page 5 of your service folder if you want to take a look. It says there in verse 16 that this was his custom to be in the synagogues teaching on the Sabbath. And it tells us that the attendant handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And that opening it up, he began to read from them from the place that we call Isaiah 61. And after he was finished reading that, he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And so his sermon began. This was his custom, Luke tells us. In chapter 4, verse 16, his custom to be the preacher and the reader in the synagogues for worship. And not only was that his custom this day, but Luke leads into this in the previous verses, verses 14 to 15, to say that this is what Jesus regularly did as he went around the countryside. We're told in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, that Jesus returned in the spirit to Galilee and reports spread about him throughout the surrounding countryside, and he taught in their synagogues, and he was glorified by all. That's verses 14 and 15, right before our lesson begins in verse 16. And then in verse 16... Luke starts to give particular attention to this specific Sabbath day and to this specific synagogue and to this specific village out of all the other ones because this is the synagogue where Jesus would have worshipped as a boy. This is the place where he would have taken his Torah instruction as an adolescent, a lot like our confirmation program today. This is the synagogue of his family, of his family's friends, of the neighbors. These are the people that claim Jesus as their own. And so Luke introduces this to us in verse 16 by telling us, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought Jesus was coming home. There may be wild reports spreading about him throughout the countryside, but they didn't know that wild side of Jesus. So whatever those reports are saying about Jesus casting out demons and opening the eyes of the blind, well, that may be so in those reports, but the Jesus they knew was familiar. They were comfortable with him. He's almost domestic. I mean, this is the young man who worked alongside Joseph, the carpenter, in his carpenter shop. Domestication is a process that takes place over the course of many, many years, decades, even centuries. Domestication goes from generation to generation as a species, not just one individual member of a species, but all the members of the species, through selective breeding, begin to show genetic traits that are more favorable in relationships to humans. So, for example, domestic chickens, unlike their two-pound wild cousins, can become up to 17 pounds. And unlike their wild cousins that lay maybe seven eggs a year, domestic chickens can lay up to 200 eggs a year or more. There are advantages to domestication. Anthropologists trace the domestication of plant and animal species back tens of thousands of years. But scripturally speaking, humans have been domesticating plants and animals since 
almost the dawn of creation. Already in Genesis chapter 4, we're told that the first generation of people born in this world, Cain and Abel, were cultivating crops and tending sheep. Domestication. It allows plant and animal species to be more favorable to humankind, both for relationship, but also so that humans can take advantage of them, either for work or for food, or perhaps simply for comfort and companionship. Dogs and cats are comfortable living in domestic settings with humans, and other animals not so much. When I was young, my parents had some friends who bred and raised exotic animals. Other people breed cattle, they bred bison. Other people breed dogs, they bred wallabies. Oh, they bred dogs too, but only rare breeds of dogs. And so on occasion, they'd come over to our family's house for dinner. And when they come over to dinner, sometimes they'd bring with them a brand new Joey wallaby. For those who aren't familiar with wallabies, a full-grown wallaby is a little like a small kangaroo. And even the new joeys can be like two feet tall. And they'd bring this joey over, and it was in a purse-like fluffy pouch that they would have slung over their shoulder, and it was hanging there as if it was in its own mother's pouch. And then occasionally it would hop out of that pouch and then begin hopping around the living room before coming back to its owner and then diving headfirst back into the pouch again. It was cute and odd and strange and fascinating. And I never thought when I was a kid about whether that animal was domestic or wild. Now, the bison, I knew those were wild because they had told stories about being gored by their own bison. But the wallaby, as it was hopping around the room, I never thought to myself whether this should be hopping around the living room or whether it should be out free in the wild somewhere. But the people in Nazareth at the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 had never given a thought about that either when it came to Jesus. Because he was in their synagogue. He was in the living room of their religious and spiritual life. They had, they had come to know and claimed him as their own. They never thought about whether he belonged to them or not. They just assumed that he did. That, that he was theirs. That, that he was theirs and, and he was adorable. And, and so it said, they all spoke well of him. Luke chapter 4, verse 22. And he was a little strange. And so they marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth, Luke tells us. Luke 4, verse 22. But he was theirs. He belonged to them. He's from Nazareth, born and bred. Well, he was born while the family was on vacation for the census in Bethlehem. But they came back to their hometown. This was their hometown, Nazareth. It's where the parents were from. At least it's where his mother was from. Luke tells us that in chapter 1. And so regardless of the wild reports that were spreading about him, they <laughs> presumed him to be familiar, quite domestic, one of their own, to be used for their own advantage. But that in the narrative is where things start to get wild. But before we get to those untamed aspects of Luke chapter 4, let me first just make notice that in a lot of ways we're a lot like the people of Nazareth. We're a lot like those folks who tend to see Jesus as somebody we are very familiar with. We do this in our hopes and expectations that show up in our prayers. We tend to domesticate Jesus. So if I'm sick, I want Jesus to heal me. If I'm lonely, I want Jesus to reassure me that I'm not alone. If I'm struggling to wonder with any kind of certainty whether anything I'm doing is accomplishing anything worthwhile, I want Jesus to give that lasting significance. And if I'm having a hard day, and I think somebody else is to blame, that I want Jesus on my side when I blame them. Or at least some words of his that'll back me up from the scriptures. Right? Now, there's not that there's necessarily anything wrong with those things to want or to pray for, except the blaming other people. It's always usually more helpful to self assess when we're having a hard day rather than to put that on other people. But nonetheless, the trouble we get into when we do any of those things is that we tend to make Jesus into the kind of Savior we want him to be rather than allowing him to be the God who 
quote, works out everything according to the counsel of his will, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Because if Jesus is the God who works out everything according to the counsel of his will, then he might actually have a purpose for this sickness in my life. And if Jesus is the one who, quote, works out everything according to the purpose of his will, then he might actually have grace, unexpected grace, for the people that I'm looking to blame. When Jesus began to point out these kinds of internal hopes and aspirations among the people in the synagogue in Nazareth, that's when things start getting wild. And when I say wild, I mean really wild. But that's the problem with bringing exotic wild animals into your own living space. You see, because you can tame one individual animal to live around humans. But just doing that doesn't take away those genetic characteristics of wildness that are operating in that species of animal. And so there are several cats at Cattail Zoological Park, just a few north, miles north of here in Mead, who have been rescued from people's private homes or private owners. And you can read about their stories. So you go out to the Cattail's website, and they have stories about each one of their cats, like Amala, the bobcat. And it says of her that even though that she was bred and raised in captivity, that she, like all bobcats, still holds her wild demeanor. And so despite the care and love that she received from her previous owners, as she matured, she became too dangerous for them to keep. What's interesting here about Luke chapter 4 is that even though these people in the synagogue in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth were seeking to domesticate him, it's not Jesus but it's the people who turn wild. And, and so we find that Jesus goes on in his sermon to say to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. The miracles that we heard you did in Capernaum do here in your hometown as well. Now, there's nothing really in the text up to that point to prepare us for why Jesus quotes to them that proverb. It's not a biblical proverb. It's just a common saying that they would have been familiar with. Physician, heal yourself. But there is a biblical proverb that helps us understand why Jesus might have said that. And that's Proverbs 16, verse 2, which says, All the ways of a person are right in their own eyes, but it's the Lord who weighs the spirit. Proverbs 16, 2. All the ways of a person are right in their own eyes, but it's the Lord who weighs the spirit. So in this episode, Jesus, in the spirit, is discerning from their spirits that something in their spirit is not right. That they are seeking to use Jesus for their own advantage. That they want to see his miracles because they want to benefit from his supernatural powers. And in some way, keep them and benefit from him for themselves. And so Jesus goes on in his sermon to tell them a story about two of their very much loved and admired prophets from the Old Testament. Elijah and Elisha. And about how they reserved some of their most remarkable miracles. Not for the people in their own hometown, but for people outside their hometown. And even people outside their home country of Israel. I mean, to do these miracles for complete outsiders and extend the grace of God out there. That is when things get wild. <laughs> when they heard this, we're told in the text that when they heard these things, verse 28, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and drove Jesus out of town to the brow of the hill in which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. They didn't succeed. There would be another wild crowd on another day that would succeed in putting him to death up on a cross rather than down a cliff. And he did give them the miracle that they were looking for. Well, not the one they were expecting, but he did give them a miracle. <laughs> the miracle was he passed right through their murderous mist, unscathed. And even later when that other wild crowd would succeed in putting him to death by crucifying him on a cross. He would give them a miracle they weren't expecting. Three days later, he rose from the dead. I, I, I've never 
been that filled with rage that I was ready to try to kill somebody or even think about killing somebody. But I know the wild streak from which that anger springs because it's the same kind of outrage that wells up in me at times and I imagine wells up in you as well. It's a wild streak that occasionally comes from righteous concerns, but more often than not, <laughs> it comes from sinful genetics. It comes from our sinful nature, that sinful nature that we're all born with. That sinful nature likes it when Jesus conforms to our expectations. That sinful nature likes it when we can domesticate Jesus into doing the things that we want him and hope that he will do for us. That's the sinful nature that's operating regularly in people like you and me. Now, before you find out later and want to run me off a cliff, I'll just let you know right now that this idea of domesticating God is not something I came up with on my own. This sermon is original. These words and the way I'm putting this together is all original. But this idea that people try to domesticate God, that I got from a theologian named William Plocker. And in 1996, he wrote a book called The Domestication of Transcendence. And in the book, he's reviewing the modern scholarly theological frameworks and conceptions of who God is and the way that they put God in a box and sort of try to domesticate God for people. But what he is looking at from a scholarly and theological level, I think, is operative in the mundane of our everyday lives, in the way that we live our prayer lives, and the way we relate to Jesus as our Savior. And so at the end of William Plocker's lengthy tome, he writes this. The God known in Christ, Luther insisted, is the God of the humble, the miserable, the afflicted, the oppressed, the desperate, and those who have been brought down to nothing at all. The God whose character is to exalt the humble, to feed the hungry, to enlighten the blind, to comfort the miserable and the afflicted, to justify sinners, and to give life to the dead, and to save those who are desperate and damned. That's a quote in William Plocker from Martin Luther's lectures in the Galatians commentary of 1535. But it's also reminiscent of what Jesus says to the people in his hometown of Nazareth in the synagogue that day, reflecting on Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, which says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach and proclaim good news to the poor and to set at liberty the captives, to grant recovery of sight to the blind and to proclaim to liberty to those who are oppressed and the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus said that all of this has been fulfilled today in your hearing. Because that has been fulfilled in Jesus, we too are set at liberty. Only that liberty, that Christian freedom, Plocker says, it makes Christians free. But Christian freedom is not some power to act independently of God. That would define freedom as equivalent to sin. Rather, it is... Because Christians trust they have been justified by grace, that they need not worry about justifying themselves, that frees them to act boldly and to take chances and to risk the foolishness of love. This is what Jesus is doing when he comes to us. When he comes to us in our church, when he comes to us in worship, when he comes into the living room of our spiritual and religious life, when he comes into our devotional time, when he comes into our prayer life, when he comes into my heart and my life and your heart and your life, what Jesus is doing is domesticating us. He's removing from us that wild streak in us uh, that sin causes, which would otherwise lash out critically at people around us in threatening ways. And instead, he's replacing that with his demeanor of love and grace. He's pulling out that sin that would rather use him and his powers for our own advantage and instead replacing it with a love that seeks the advantage of other people around us. He wasn't content just to be the savior of the people of Nazareth because as they thought, well, this was his home. 
But he didn't live there anymore. In fact, he never lived there again. We don't even know from the scriptures if he ever visited there again. Although I know he did come to some of them. Because Jesus said, whoever believes me, loves me, and keeps my word, my Father will love that person and we will come and make our home with them. John 14, 23. And so Jesus comes to abide with his people. And when Jesus abides with his people, John says, then God's love abides with us. First John chapter 4, verse 12. God's love abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And that's good news to the poor. That's good news proclaimed to the poor because the compassion of God extends from us to them. And that's good news for those who are oppressed because through us, the favor of God comes to them. And that's good news for those who are blind because faith sees what eyes cannot. And that's good news for those who are captive because God's love sets us free. Jesus said it. These words of Isaiah have been fulfilled. And now they've been fulfilled in our hearing too. In Jesus' name, amen.